And my original motivation was Uranus and Neptune, but I wrote a proposal to NASA saying, I wanna make sure that this new telescope, when it is built, can study all the things in the solar system. That was the proposal that NASA accepted, and I became a scientist for the James Webb Space Telescope program. So fast forward 25 years, imagine hundreds and hundreds of meetings over the years. And when we, when I saw the first image of the planet Neptune taken with the James Webb Space Telescope, I started to cry. I believe that there must be life elsewhere. It is too big and there's too many possibilities for life not to have evolved somewhere else out in the universe. I think that that's an important question to ask, Raj, because a lot of times uh, people are working in their silos and they aren't thinking about ramifications of what they're doing outside of their silos. And so I, I think you're asking a really important question. Exciting episode coming on the Seekers Mind Talks today with Heidi Hamill. She is the interdisciplinary scientist for the James Webb, the most powerful telescope on our planet right now. She's also played crucial roles in the discoveries made by the Hubble telescope with which we understood much of the universe. She is also the Vice President of Aura, the Association of Universities for Research in Astronomy. There's much wisdom, wonderful stories and experience shared in today's episode. Don't miss it. You're watching Seekers Mind Talks, the science and spiritual podcast. I want to start with a funny question. Uh, it might not be funny, but uh, is the answer to the question where are we right now? Really, we don't know. What do you mean by where are we? What do you, I don't know what you mean by that question. We say, so let me ask you, where are you right now? Well, right now I'm sitting in my office in Washington, DC. Yes, but that's relative to Earth. Right. Where is Earth right now? Earth is orbiting the sun. Uh-huh. Mm-hmm. So and where is... Yeah, so where is, it's, it's, it's the, in the solar system. So where's the solar system right now? Right. So, I mean, I see where you're going with this. Yes. You know, the solar system, our solar system is located in one arm of a galaxy, a large collection of stars that we call the Milky Way galaxy. We're in an insignificant spiral arm called the Sagittarius arm. We're, you know, three quarters of the way out. And that's where we are. Your next question is, well, where's the galaxy located? Well, we're part of a larger cluster of galaxies. Um, and where are those clusters of galaxies located? They're located in the broader universe. And where is the universe located? It is. It's not <laughs> located in a thing. It just is. It exists. And so we are in it. Um, some people speculate that there could be other universes, but mm -hmm. we have no observational proof of that. There's only mathematical descriptions of how that might possibly be. But for all of the telescopes that have ever been built and have ever been used to study the cosmos, we have seen no evidence for these uh, for other universes at this point. We we are in a universe and it exists, and so mm -hmm. that's, that's where we are. But but then can we be hundred percent sure that that universe is just it? Uh, like when we look, there's definitely boundaries. There's galaxies. There's uh, universe and extrapolating that there should be something next right it's just that we don't know yet or so my question there might be uh the right answer to the, is the right answer to the question where are we right now we don't know yet you could you could always put it that way um you know we are always limited by our knowledge and mm -hmm. our ability to answer questions like you're asking every time we build a new telescope with greater sensitivity, we can see further in the universe. We can see parts of the universe we weren't able to measure before. So we learn more about the world in which we live. And we, as I said, we have mathematical models, physical, con you know, theoretical constructs that suggest maybe there are other universes. Uh, currently, we have no way of measuring or detecting that. 
And so, yeah, we don't know. That is always going to be an answer until we learn the thing. Like we didn't always know what gravity was. We didn't always know what light was. Uh, so we learn things. That's the job of a scientist is to inquire all the time, to always be asking questions, which is actually kind of something fundamental that I like to share that science is not about knowing answers. That's not what science is. Science is about asking questions mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. seeing what the observations that you make of the environment around you, the thing you're studying, the, you know, the world you live in, what the observations tell you to inform your understanding. That's what science is. It's always asking questions. So anybody who says to me, scientists think they know all the facts. I'm like, well, you've never actually talked to a scientist. <laughs> we don't we don't know facts you know we 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 try to make measurements and observations of our world that make sense with our understanding of the world and when mm -hmm. they make sense then we say okay that's good that holds together that theory is solid theory of gravitation is solid until something comes along that changes it you know and that's what einstein was so amazing that he had the mental capacity to envision a different way of thinking about the world, about physics, about how things interact and make predictions, which all turned out to be right. So it's like, well, no, he's obviously right. That's not to say that some other young person is not going to come along in, in five, 10, 15, 20 years and turn things on their heads and say, you know what, Einstein was right about this, but he missed this, this, and this. So, you know, as scientists, we're always mm -hmm. open to the that. The reason I, I, why, why I asked that question is because I read this quote somewhere that uh, a question opens the mind while a statement closes it, right? So the human mind has the natural tendency to find out answers for questions. And when we take things for granted, like simple questions, like where we are right now, and if I think I'm in Earth right now, that gives that's a kind of a statement, right? And when we really dig into it and it ends up in the question, we don't know where we are, that kind of naturally intrigues the mind into a scientist type of mentality. Absolutely. And I, I think that's vital for learning as well. That's why we, uh, we love talking to little kids, like three-year-olds, because they're born scientists. If you've ever been around a three-year-old when they're in the state where they're just like, why? Why is the, you know, why is the grass green? Well, it has to do with it's a plant. Why? Well, you know, it's chlorophyll. But why? And and it's just always asking the next question. That's that's science at its purest. People are born <laughs> scientists. And, uh, you know. And, the, and then society kills it? Nah, sometimes schooling kills it, you know. Mm -hmm. When schooling is like training people to memorize facts training people to take tests, um, that, that's not a good way to foster creativity and independent thinking um, and enjoyment and joy and wonder. Um, so, you know, sometimes it's the educational system that kind of beats out the, the joy and the scientific thinking out of it. Um, you know, sometimes it's just environments. It's, it's hard to be joyful if you're living in a an extremely difficult environment when there's wars or violence, things like that. Um, but even so, it, it's it's part of the human capacity to always be wondering. We have a lot more tools now to explore than we did even even you know when I was born, you know, sixty something years ago. Um, the tools we have today, not only in my field, astronomy, but the tools we have um, in terms of scanning electron microscopes, the tools we have in chemistry, the tools we have in medicine. Um, all these are uh, different ways of, of allowing us to ask those deeper questions of why are we here? How did we get here? Where are we going in the long run? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Certainly, uh, you won, if I remember correctly, you won the Carl Sagan medal back in 2002, right? And that itself stands for this kind of a learning on how to invoke wonder 
to the people around you and you've been successful at that what does that medal stand for really well that that medal does stand for acknowledging that you can be a scientist someone who is actively pursuing this knowledge at a very deep and detailed level and still at the same time be able to bring it to a higher level and think about it and communicate with people who aren't working in the very detailed level. Um, Carl Sagan, of who that medal was named after, was masterful at being able to communicate really big ideas, ideas that it takes years to learn, um, but the concepts behind the ideas are things that we all should be able to communicate. And so I'm very proud to have a medal named after Carl Sagan. Um, I learned a lot by watching him and listening to him. I was, I was a very young scientist when he was at the peak of his work, but we interacted several times. And um, I, you can't, I, you know, he's just, uh, for, for a scientist, for someone like me, who believes that communicating science is as important as doing the science, um, he, he's an icon in our field. Mm, because science. Why, why are we doing this for, right? It's for humanity. And, and if it doesn't get out, if it doesn't, just like you were saying, you were in a meeting to bring up new scientists. It's just as important as doing science and invoking science. Yeah. And some people, uh, not everybody has the same skill set. <laughs> some <laughs> people are extraor extraordinarily good at doing science. Um, and they, but they've never learned how to communicate what they do, um, and so it takes all kinds it, of people to be able to really advance a scientific enterprise. Um, I think you know I'm very proud of all the work that I've done as a scientist over the past you know thirty something years, but I'm also very proud that part of my career has been communicating science. And because of that, I have now seen the next generation of scientists and the one after that coming after me who value communication tremendously and mm. think it is so important to talk about the science we do, to make it accessible through tools that regular people use. I think we, in the internet age, we are seeing more and more of that now. Even uh, your friend, Neil deGrasse Tyson, he is a master at this. Yeah. I will share with you that um, when I was a younger scientist, uh, people like Carl Sagan and Neil deGrasse Tyson were looked down on. They're like, oh, mm -hmm. they're not real scientists. They're communicators, which is not true. Both of them have legitimate scientific um, resumes. And Carl Sagan, you know, to the end of his life, was deeply interested in pursuing different aspects of planetary science, exploring the chemistry, in, um, in other environments and what implications that has for how these other environments evolve with time. Um, that I think that that uh, disdain for communicators is still there a little bit. I, I hear it sometimes, uh, but I think that uh, the, the fact that there are so many young people now who are good communicators and or who are using modern tools, like I watch some of these TikTok videos, right? I'm like, oh my gosh, these people are doing great science communication. It's awesome. Um, I, I, you know, I, I feel like uh, I've had a little piece of, little piece to play in that, you know, by always being there, getting out there, communicating what I do and talking about the science that I do. Why do we need to learn about the universe at all? I mean, it doesn't give us food. It doesn't stop wars, but why is the need? Well, there's a couple of ways to answer that. While it may not stop wars, um, it does change people's perspective about who they are and what they do. And sometimes um, having the ability to take a step away from the day-to-day -day stuff you're doing and simply experience wonder and joy and awe, that can change people and make them think differently about themselves and others. So that's a philosophical kind of answer. I could also give you a really kind of gory technical answer 
in uh, along the lines of as we are building more and more advanced tools to do astronomy, we are building things like more advanced detectors, faster computers, algorithms that are using data in different ways. And those tools that we use and build in our field of astronomy, which sounds esoteric, you're looking at stars, you know, we're actually translating those tools into better detectors uh, for, for things like, um, I don't know, uh, looking at the earth from space rather than mm -hmm. looking from, from the earth out to space, putting detectors in space that look down at earth. Um, things like um, using algorithms that we use to, to automatically process images of galaxies, people can use those same kinds of algorithms to look at um, scans of, of the human body in a computer system and using these processing algorithms to analyze that kind of data. Um, another example that just it floated through my mind. Oh, uh, we have been developing tools in astronomy to look through the Earth's atmosphere, which is always turbulent and in motion, and it kind of messes up our pictures. So we've been developing what we call adaptive optics tools to take away that motion. Um, and we use it for astronomy, but there are people who use the same adaptive optics tools to look through the human eyeballs at the back of the retina through all the fluid that is in people's eyeballs, which wow. is fluid that's, you know, moving around, making it hard to image the back of the retina. And so there's a lot, when you advance any scientific field, pushing the boundaries, you are developing new capabilities and new technologies and new methodologies that you don't know what is going to happen with them. Um, a completely unrelated to astronomy one that I like to talk about is the internet. I mean, do you know where the internet came from? You know why we have an internet? I think it started with some <laughs> army use or something, right? Sending yeah, messages. Yeah, the DARPA That's was looking what... into it. The army was looking into it. But the, the protocols that we use today, the little HTTP that you see at the beginning in many of our long URLs, that was developed at CERN. That's like the... the, the um, the place where they have a large accelerator over in Europe where they're doing high energy particle physics. And they wanted to share, the scientist who was there, Tim Berners-Lee, wanted to be able to communicate his data with other high energy physicists. So he figured out a way to allow his computer to talk to other people's computers. So it was to do high energy physics, which normally has very little to do with you know, how you buy a book now on, on your computer, right? Or how you and I are talking right now. That's not what he set out to do. He was setting out a way that they could continue their collaboration in studying the, you know, particles in a linear accelerator. And now we have the internet and you and I can sit in random parts of the world and talk to one or, one another just like this. So... Yeah, that twofold answer is wonderful. And uh, I was also intrigued by the first part you said about the experience of awe, because just in the last episode, I had a neuroscientist. Uh, her name was Jill Taylor. You might know her. Uh, she had a stroke in the left rational brain, which got short circuited for eight years. And she had no left brain for eight years, but she was a brain neuroanatomist from Harvard and she got the ability to look at the world for eight years without concepts, labels or anything and that drastically changed her world view and she had the same awe experience for eight years because this, this, all this, she said that she was like in the precipice of everything and she could not identify the boundaries of her body anymore and she was in constant awe and she had to learn language back eight years. He had to learn every other concept back for eight years. And that feeling of awe just in the right brain, it changed her life drastically and whole, wholly. And I think that's, we are going, when we learn about the universe, we, we are kind of, kind of doing the same thing in a slower way. I think you're right. I mean, one reason we think that all the gorgeous pictures that we get from the Hubble Space Telescope and now the James Webb Space Telescope and other very powerful ground-based telescopes, they give us these views of objects that are on scales that are so different 
than the human scales we live on on a day-to-day -day basis. And it, to, to even contemplate what you're seeing in one of these pictures um, forces you to take a step away from your day-to-day -day and, and your environment and, and sort of broaden your mind and open your mind and suddenly realize that there's a vastness out there that's so much larger than what we deal with all the time. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. C certainly that, that, that has affected me personally too. And me doing this podcast right now and realigning my goals is widening that perspective, widening that consciousness of how big of a universe there is and uh, the need to be think more wholly or, or in a more, um, what's the word I'm looking for? in a world, more comprehensive manner mm -hmm. and 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 do do, do you think uh, in a normal population people are far from it well i think that many people when they're given the opportunity to think about these things they take it they like it um i, I give a lot of public lectures you know just to regular people you know who just want to hear about the newest things we've learned in astronomy and, um, you know, I, I'm not going to go into all the detailed equations and science and analysis that we do, because, you know, that, that, that is all kind of important from a scientific perspective, but from a communication perspective and from a, an ability to share with other people what we've learned, we don't need to go into all the gory detail. Um, it's, we need to have it. I mean... I don't want to just show you a picture and say, trust me, I know what's in the picture. I mean, I, I when I show you a picture of Jupiter from the James Webb Space Telescope, you can be assured that I and my team members have, you know, taken that thing, that picture apart sort of pixel by pixel and and color photon by color photon, trying to understand what it is telling us scientifically. But it makes a beautiful picture that I can share with you and tell you that we've learned that on Jupiter, there's a high speed jet of, of, of wind blowing at the equator that we never knew about before because we never had the right sensitivity at the right color of light to pick it up out of all the other swirling atmosphere that was there until we built James Webb Space Telescope. Mm -hmm. You know, and there's there's like there's discoveries that are that are in there in just that one image um, that are just, uh, you know, I, I, you know, I just, there's so much to talk about. And that's just one image that I know a lot about. You know, there are <clears throat> dozens of other kinds of fabulous images of galaxies and nebulae and places where stars are being born, stars that are dying. You know, all, all of it is all happening out there in the universe. It's all happening. And we don't pay attention to it on a daily basis because we're like driving to work, picking the kids up after school, dropping off our dry cleaning, going to the grocery store so we can make dinner. You know, all, we're doing all the things we do. But in the meantime, there's a world out there that is just doing its thing. Hmm. And, and certainly there are rocks out there that can hit us and take us all out as well. Let's talk about the big, how excited were you about the James Webb and how excited are you? even now? Well, it, it's hard for me to convey it in a, <laughs> a few words. You know, I, I worked on the James Webb Space Telescope program for over 25 years. Um, I started working on that program before it was even a program, but back when it was just an idea that we astronomers had about the next big telescope we wanted to build after Hubble. We started thinking about this even before Hubble was launched. And um, I got involved with it because I had been doing a lot of work studying the planets Uranus and Neptune. I had been using ground, the best ground-based telescopes there were 35 years ago, um, which were not good enough to tell us very much. But then we had a spacecraft called the Voyager 2 spacecraft fly by Uranus and Neptune, and we learned so much. And I was thinking, where, how am I going to build on what we've learned? And there were no missions to Uranus and Neptune on the books back then, 35 years ago. There still are no 
missions to Uranus and Neptune on the books 35 years later, although we've been talking about it for 35 years. You would really want that, right? <laughs> I, did, I would love that. But, you know, at the time, you know, 25 years ago, I, I looked around and I said, you know what? This new telescope that's going to be built, it's going to be so powerful that it is going to give us new views of these planets beyond what we have been able to do. Now, it's not like having a spacecraft there, right? I'm always going to advocate for the spacecraft there. However, um, it it fills the gap between mm. when we actually did visit these spacecraft back in 1980, these uh, planets back in 86 and 89, and when we ever do in the future. Um, I don't mm. know if I'll even be alive then, but at least, uh, you know, we will be, advancing our knowledge and learning new things. So that's a that's a long way of saying I worked on this telescope for a long time and my original motivation was Uranus and Neptune, but I wrote a proposal to NASA saying, I wanna make sure that this new telescope, when it is built, can study all the things in the solar system, not just mm. Uranus and Neptune, but Jupiter and Mars and comets and asteroids and Pluto and other objects out there near Pluto um, and the moons and the rings of these other uh, planets. Um, and so that was the proposal that NASA accepted. And I became a scientist for the James Webb Space Telescope program. So fast forward 25 years, imagine hundreds and hundreds of meetings over the years. <laughs> and when we, when I saw the first image of the planet Neptune taken with the James Webb Space Telescope, I started to cry. I was just like, I was like, I can't believe it. After all these years. And, you know, one of the things that was so exciting to me, I mean, I knew it would be a great image, right? I knew the, we could see the planet. But what we saw in the image was the ring system of Neptune. And we hadn't, I hadn't, no human had seen that ring system in its entirety since 1989. It had been decades because we didn't have the tools to do it. It's too faint and too small for even our biggest telescopes. And then with James Webb, there was the image and the rings of Neptune. And there I'm like, oh. I was like, so I was crying. But then like, I was like, then I got it. Then I realized what I was looking at. And I was like, wow, this is so, my goodness, this is amazing. I'm like carrying on. And I'm yelling and I'm like, oh, my cat was there. So I scooped my cat up and I'm like, look, look at this. I called my mother down. She's like, are you okay? I'm like, see this picture. You know, so I was just hugely excited by it. I just like, it was so much fun. And, um, Basically, every person who proposed to do some observation with JWST, when they got their data, they had that emotion. The same feeling. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's... So we go to these meetings, right, where we show mm -hmm. our data to one another. And th I, this is this is a little geeky, but, you know, pictures are one thing, right? And, and JWST makes awesome pictures. But what we astronomers get super excited about is, a, is data called spectra, where mm -hmm, we mm -hmm. take the light from an object and we spread it out into the full rainbow of colors, and then we measure the brightness at the different colors. And different chemicals out there in the cosmos, they emit light at different colors, or they can absorb light at different colors. So when you spread this light out, you get this sort of squiggly line where some things are bright and some things are faint, but to an astronomer, it's like, oh my gosh, there's carbon dioxide. Oh my gosh, there is like iron. Oh, there's this. And that, you know, that so we get excited about that. So I, I share that because when we go to a scientific conference for, for JWST data, people will be showing the pictures and we'll all be sitting there going, isn't that nice? Let me check my phone, see how things are going. You know, but then they'll put up this spectrum and it will be the room will go quiet and then people will be gasping. They might break out into a spontaneous applause because the sensitivity of JWST is so powerful that we can sense this chemistry 
and physics and dynamics in the most distant part of the universe and see it right in these spectra. We can see molecules that are the, some of the oldest molecules that were ever formed or at the most distant galaxies that ever formed. And we can see what they're made of. And that's just mind blowing. I just, that's, I just, that, uh, yeah. I, I can feel your feeling and how <laughs> bizarre that <laughs> I, I can connect with you there because it's, it's beyond imagination. It, we, nobody would have thought we would have reached at this point where we can understand how, how far does the James Webb is able to look at and how, how, how far is it able to look at and analyze and find the chemistry, if I am to ask that question. Yeah, I mean, it, you know, we, we, we have, we, every time there's a new paper, records are broken, you know. <laughs> um, we have different ways of talking about how distant things are. Um, mm -hmm. We can either use, you know, years, like going back in time. We, it's like a time machine, um, because when we look at distant objects, we're seeing them in the past. Um, so we can talk about going back, you know, 13.8 billion years, right? Or we could talk about how many hundreds of thousands of years after the Big Bang, which our theoretical understanding today is that's when our universe came into existence. Mm. And so any way you cut it, JWST is pushing the envelope much further than we had anticipated. Well, the, the, let me put it, let me phrase it this way. We did build this telescope to see these earliest galaxies that ever formed in the universe. What was surprising to us was how good JWST turned out to be, which is a which is like a credit to the amazing NASA engineers and engineers from the European Space Agency and the Canadian Space Agency who built the tool. It works fabulously. But when we did see those earliest galaxies, they turned out to be somewhat brighter than we expected and mm -hmm. a little bit more uh, structured than we had expected. And so that's good. Because if they were exactly like we had expected, we wouldn't have learned anything. So now it's like, wow, wait a minute. You know, the, the theories we had about how galaxies formed in these very earliest times in the formation of a universe, mm -hmm. we are revisiting them. We're, you know, we're not changing physics. There's a lot of goofy headlines out there. JWST is changing physics. It's not changing physics. But it is causing us to think very deeply about the theoretical models we were using to explain what we thought we were going to see and now we actually are seeing. So our predictions are different than our reality. And so by figuring out why, we will learn about what processes drive how our universe works. And mm. you know, you're like, well, how does how does that help me? <laughs> well, I don't know how it helps you or me, right? But we didn't really understand how, like, the general theory of relativity would help anybody, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But now it turns out, you know what? If you want your GPS system, like, on your phone to help you drive from point A to point B through a satellite, you have to use the theory of general relativity correctly or it won't work, all right? <laughs> so there may be things that in the future, what we're learning about how our universe actually works, how mm -hmm. it forms how things evolve, that may have relevance to something down the line that, that you and I haven't thought of today. Hmm. One question I had there was, uh, you said we are looking back, it's a time machine, we are looking back in time, right? Like yeah. it, it takes time for light from that galaxy or star or whatever to come to the JWST and we are looking at the past. Yeah. So does that mean in the present it's not there or it might not be there or it's, it's, it's physical structure and chemical composition and it's, it's all completely different in the uh -huh. now? Can we, can we define time? What is now? It's it, certainly we know by this point, everybody knows it's relative. But what's really happening there? Yeah, well, that's a great question. Um, so if I look at um, a distant galaxy and a supernova explodes in that galaxy, so a star explodes and makes a bright flash of light. Well, if that galaxy is 65 million light years away, it's taken the light from that supernova 65 million years to reach us. 
And that means if you and I were able to warp space and instantly be at that galaxy, that star wouldn't be there anymore. It would have died 65 million years ago, dispersed it. It would be gone. It would be different. So, yeah, the, the things that are out there that we are seeing, uh, they are things that are happening at that time. And we are seeing them here now. I mean, most people don't think about this, but in when we, those of us who do space work, we think about this all the time. Like when I when I had to work on the Voyager mission that one was doing the Neptune flyby back in 1989, one of my jobs as a young scientist, my job was to be at the telescope on Earth taking images of Neptune while Voyager was literally flying past Neptune. And then we were going to combine the data. But it takes the light from Neptune over four hours to reach us. And so the images that I got were always four hours behind the images that were coming from Voyager. And so we have to take that into account in astronomy in a very real way. Um, and then, you know, that's four hours. That's that's time scales that we can kind of understand, you know. But um, when you start talking about, you know, millions of years and billions of years, we're getting to numbers that are like not numbers that humans normally deal with. And so mm. it's a little harder for people to get their head around that. How, how bizarre is that concept of time for you guys then? It, it's, it's not bizarre. It's, it's uh -huh. just math and physics, you know, and uh -huh. we don't, we don't get worked up about it. I mean, I know I got a light up here shining on me and it, there's photons that are shining on my face so when I look at the light, I know that when I see the photon in my eyeball, it's taken sort of a extremely short amount of time, but not zero time to get to my eye, right? Um, you know, but if if the, if my light were on the moon, you know, it would take much longer. And if this light were on Neptune, it would take four hours. If this light were on uh, the nearest star to us, Proxima Centauri, it would take four years. That's where the word light years comes from. Light years is not time. It's a distance, right? So does that make sense? I, I mean, we yes, yes. It. it's math, right? I can do the math. <laughs> I got the math. It's no problem. No, I, I really want to do a whole episode about time somewhere in the future because it it it, it keeps me up at night, frankly speaking. Uh, like, what's the most intriguing discovery that JWST has made till now, or that, in your view, is the most significant or has altered your consciousness? Well, I, you know, I have so many different ways of answering that question because there's so much incredible knowledge come from JWST. I think, you know, we, the purpose of this telescope was really to study those earliest galaxies. And the mm -hmm. fact that when we did see them, they were not what we expected, that's huge. As I you know, because that means we're going to learn a lot about how our galaxy, I'm sorry, how our universe actually came to be. So I would say, like, sort of on the grand scale of things, Right now, today, that's like the number one most uh, important result we've had. We've also um, another result that is kind of it's a, it's a it's a non result, but it's making us scratch our heads. We are using this telescope, James Webb Space Telescope, to look at the atmospheres of planets around other stars, and we mm -hmm. were particularly interested in trying to look at the atmospheres of rocky planets, planets that are like the size of our Earth, to see if they have atmospheres like the Earth. And so there's one system that that um, the science that JWST has been studying very closely called the TRAPPIST-1 system. It has mm -hmm. seven Earth-sized planets in that system going around this small reddish star. And so we were uh, gonna be looking at all the different planets to look for their atmospheres. And what's the sort of the non-result as of today, this may change, but as of today, is we don't seem to be seeing significant atmospheres there in that system. Mm. And so mm. like, wow, that, that starts you thinking about, wow, if the, if the most obvious one for JWST to look at, this most obvious planets, and they're not seeing atmospheres, 
you know, what's that going to tell us about how rare atmospheres are going to be? Now, there's a lot of work yet to be done. And I want to be clear, we did not build JWST to answer the question of whether or not there are Earth-like planets around sun-like stars with atmospheres, right? That's not why we built that telescope. We built that telescope to study the early universe, but it's doing other great stuff. We're now, uh, when I say we, I mean our broad astronomical community, we are now talking about what is the next telescope that we do want to build in the future. You know, mm -hmm. once we're done, once JWST has finished its mission, um, you know, 20 years from now, what telescope do we want to have then? And for that telescope, the question we do want to answer is, how common are atmospheres on Earth-like planets around Sun-like stars? Is there another Earth-like planet out there? That's mm -hmm. the telescope that we're now thinking about how to build. It's called the Habitable Worlds Observatory. Mm -hmm. And it's a very different kind of telescope. It's not the same as JWST. It's sort of like Hubble, but much larger. And um, and it has slightly different um, equipment on it that's specifically tuned to help us study the atmospheres of these planets. Um, you know, uh, if we are the generation, all of us alive today, you, me, you know, our families, our friends, if we're the people who are alive when our species finds evidence of another living species somewhere out there in the universe, that might change a lot of way of things about how people think about life, about the fragility of life on Earth. Um, if we don't find life, if we build a tool that could find it and doesn't, that will also, I think, change how we think about ourselves and how we think about our world and our environment. And mm -hmm. maybe we better protect it. it I mean, it's, it, it's too naive to say that there is nobody else out there, right? Because it's just damn too large. I think it was Carl Sagan, I don't remember who, who said that the absence of evidence is not the evidence of absence, was it? He, could, be, sounds like something he would say. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but the universe is too big. Is it naive for us to say that there are no aliens? So I, I answer this question, I get this question a lot when I give public lectures, and I answer it in two ways. One of, it, one of the ways I answer it is the question of, is there life elsewhere in the universe? Mm -hmm. And as an astronomer who has studied the sky... Um, I, I believe that there must be life elsewhere. It is too big and there's too many possibilities for life not to have evolved somewhere else out in the universe. It just seems impossible to me that given the myriad galaxies and the myriad planets around stars in these galaxies, it's, it, you know, it just, it's inconceivable to me that somewhere out there, Similar processes have taken place like they had on Earth and, and some kind of, of life may have developed. So mm -hmm. I think there is life somewhere out there. Does that mean that aliens have come to Earth in spaceships and visited us and, you know, picked up people and, you know, taken them on? What? Completely different question. <laughs> and mm -hmm. I don't believe that we've had space aliens come and visit us. I don't believe that the U.S. government has you know, spaceships and alien, you know, life forms and things like that. I just don't mm -hmm. think so. I'm, and, you know, again, we'll talk about Carl Sagan. He wrote a wonderful book that addresses this very topic called The Demon Haunted World, um, where he talks about, you know, human, uh, human needs to believe in things, to find explanations for things they don't understand. And, you know, in, in earlier generations, it was, you know, magic and witchcraft and, you know, the sorcery, things like alchemy, things like that. You know, today in our more scientific society, so that need to explain has kind of been transformed into space aliens and spaceships and things. You know, there's, 
There are so many astronomers, not only professional astronomers like me, but amateur astronomers who spend their lives studying the skies and they don't see anything, right? So, I, you know. And and when, when you're thinking of aliens, like uh, we are carbon-based life forms. Are we just looking at, uh, or are the is, is the astronomy community looking at carbon-based life forms, or are they looking at other wider options as well? So they're looking, you know, the the um, the field of of astrobiology, looking mm -hmm. for biology outside the surface of the Earth, looks at a very wide range of topics. Um, it is true that life as we understand it. Um, at the very basic level, very basic principles. I'm not just talking about people. I'm talking about like algae, bacteria, like the simplest life forms. In our Earth environment, that requires water, energy, food, replication. Um, so when we are designing tools to look for life elsewhere, whether it is on Mars or under the icy surface of Europa, Jupiter's moon Europa, or Saturn's moon Enceladus, or whether we're looking in the atmosphere of another planet like Venus or a planet around another star, we do look for life that has characteristics like we know life required to develop here on Earth. Because frankly, we have exactly one, uh, one sample of life, and that's here on Earth, right? So we know that life formed here and we you know we we have a lot of understanding we you know the biologists have a lot of understanding about how it formed here we think um and so it makes sense that we look for life that conforms to the one example we know worked now all right i'm old enough to have watched the original star trek series the og star trek when i was a child and you know the the episode with the Horta, I don't know if you know Star Trek well enough, there was an episode where there were these miners who were mysteriously dying on this world. And when the Enterprise came and they were, you know, discovering like, you know, what's going on here, they were mining these spheres. And there was this, it turned out that there was a silicon-based life form on that world. And the spheres that the miners were mining, which they just thought were like rocks or something, they were the eggs of the Horta, the silicon-based life form. And the only way they could find out was that Mr. Spock did a mind meld with the Horta, with the thing that looked like rock. But he discovered through his mind meld that it was an intelligent creature that was different from us. Now, here's the problem. That's great. Maybe we should be looking for silicon-based life forms, but we don't have a Mr. Spock who's going to do a mind meld. How do mm. you know that it's life? We, we can't we can't I can't look at a rock and say oh that's that's a lot that's an intelligent rock right so in some sense we do have limitations on what we're going to call life elsewhere let me go on a completely orthogonal track for a moment though and tell you about a different way that people have been talking about looking for evidence that other civilizations have existed and it's kind of a sad story because mm. imagine, if you will, a civilization where it has become very technical, like we are on Earth right now, and developed all kinds of machines that put uh, all kinds of weird chemicals into that planet's atmosphere, things like chloroform. Uh, chlorofluorocarbons, um, you know, weird mixtures of fluorine and stuff that, you know, are industrial byproducts, um, radioactive elements, maybe the radioactive power, things like that. And they polluted their atmosphere with things that could never form naturally. They had to be created by some industrial process. There are people that suggest what we, what we really should be looking for in these atmospheres is evidence of this pollution that could only mm. have been formed by a technical society that was essentially polluting its own atmosphere, kind of like we're doing here on Earth. Um, it's sad because, uh, you know, that means that whatever that civilization was, 
like we are, we're not living in balance with our, with our planet. Um, but that is a different way to see if another civilization has formed. Mm. There are other things too. There are Dyson spheres uh, that may have different kind of um, evidence that we might be able to see. Um, there are people who have suggested that within our own solar system, we look for evidence um, that there have been other visitors, like tracks on the surface. We're leaving tracks all over the moon right now, you know, and we can go up with um, our spacecraft and look at the moon and we can see the debris that humanity has left there. Um, at any one time, there are tracks being left all over Mars, right, by the rovers that are there. But Mars has a kind of a self-cleaning mechanism it's called global dust storms. Mm -hmm. So it will come and scour everything and remove all evidence of those tracks on Mars. But there are people who suggest, well, maybe we should be looking at some of the moons in the outer solar system that don't have thick atmospheres. Maybe there's evidence that people, uh, not people, some other civilization has visited our galaxy in the distant past and it might be there. I mean, there's a lot, there's a lot of different ways to go about this question of, is there life elsewhere in the universe? And we, you know, the community who explores this is really serious about this and looking at all of these different kinds of things that I've been talking about. Speaking of tracks, how far is the Voyager now from us? Oh, so, you know, I don't know the number because I'm not mm -hmm. good at memorizing numbers. You could probably Google that and find out how many gazillion, billion, trillion miles it is. Um, but I'll share in terms of um, how we think about it in astronomy. The sun, our sun, has a magnetic field around it. And that magnetic field creates a bubble that we call the heliosphere. Um, and it's a bubble in, in our galactic medium, right? We're in a galaxy. So all around us is this, the galaxy stuff. But our sun has this bubble called the heliosphere. And Voyager, the Voyager spacecrafts, both of them, Voyager 1 and Voyager 2, have actually gone far enough to get past the edge of that heliosphere, which we call the mm. heliopause. And they are now interstellar missions. They have moved beyond the sphere of our sun. They are outside of our solar system now by this definition, the where our sun controls the neighborhood, so to speak. So they have moved out and are now interstellar spacecraft. Mm. To me, that's the most most bizarre thing that we are, we have done, right? Because that's so 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 far from our reach, yeah. and just thinking that the probability that someday somebody might pick it up that very thought, yeah. you know, I, I was I was researching yesterday and I saw that it has everything needed to locate us and all our history and everything written in it, and and that's that's something really interesting to think about. Yeah. Yeah, it doesn't have everything, but it has enough that if people are that if the if whoever finds that call them people because that's shorthand, <laughs> but you know if the if the species that find it are sufficiently clever, they mm -hmm. would be able to decode what's on the golden record on the outside of the Voyager spacecraft, and uh, there there are indeed um, directions, so to speak, on where where the where we're located relative to some key things in our galaxy so mm -hmm, yeah mm -hmm. okay. yeah the next question might be silly but i wanted to ask anyway uh if you look at atoms everything is either spinning or rotating if we look at the earth it's spinning and rotating if you look at the galaxy it's spinning and rotating why is our reality so much with all this spinning and rotation well that's just the way of the world man everything <laughs> moves everything changes everything is dynamic right um so, but you you don't see planets going in squares, right? <laughs> no, I mean because uh, I think gravity works in a radial fashion. So if you have the sun here, you know the sun's gravity is always going away from it in a circular way, and um, a lot of these forces work the same way. So things don't go in squares. They don't turn right angles. They Everything is, is circular and, and curving. That's mm. that's just the way space and time work. You know, space-time works that way. 
Why? Yeah, what got me interested was even atoms do the same thing. Not not just because there there is no gravity there, right? And on sure, atomic they're, scale. But they're working on, on other forces, strong forces and weak forces that that mm-hmm. interact with the components, even the quarks, you know, inside inside the protons what the quarks are made of you know but you're getting pretty far afield from what i know here and i learned that- <laughs> no i just wanted to dance with that question i <laughs> i i feel that like we need more of this interdisciplinary studies because uh this book of i believe this there is a, this book you know definitely it's the uh, the structure of scientific revolution by thomas kuhn mm-hmm. uh, yeah I, i might be saying his name wrong but it says that we will hit that limit of science right but i believe that we have reached a time where we should start interacting with within disciplines more to get answers it's so challenging it though i'll tell you raj it's <laughs> challenging um because we've learned so much that um you know each of these scientific fields has developed its own language its own literature mm-hmm. its own mathematics and so it's very challenging to work in different fields i'll give you one simple example um right now we're exploring the idea of connecting telescopes on the ground not with cables and wires um but using quantum entanglement using mm. the, the principles of quantum entanglement wow to do that we astronomers have to be able to work with the specialists who under who really work in the field of quantum entanglement quantum communication and we get the we get everyone in a room together and they start talking and they they just don't even communicate they're using fundamentally different languages so we have to spend like the first couple hours like well, what do you mean by that when you say this and when you say that and you know we have to learn each other's languages and that's in a those are physics fields like when i talk to like my friends who are biologists right man the amount of chemistry that you need to know to do organic biology is something that you know i don't have the training i mean i i took organic chemistry at, at, when i was a student and i learned it but um it's not a language i speak every day and mm-hmm. so um it's hard to imagine a person today being like one of the um renaissance men <laughs> they were all men not all of them there were a few women but you know who like You know, there's a guy who's like I can't remember who it is right now. I should do my homework, but he was going to learn to everything that was that was to know. He was mm. going to learn that, right? This was like in the 1700s. And maybe that was even possible then. But there's no way that's possible today. I'm not undermining the fact that you shouldn't focus on one, but how much is that stopping humanity or how much is that a bottleneck in humanity progressing? I I think I think that that's an important question to ask Raj because mm-hmm. a lot of times um people are working in their silos and they aren't thinking about ramifications of what they're doing outside of their silos. And so I I think you're asking a really important question and I think that the way we can work on addressing this is trying to teach scientists as part of their scientific training to also be good communicators so they can communicate with each other with other scientists outside their field with the public with policy makers who run our countries who make laws about things um they should be also informed by science as well and so i think teaching uh scientists not just to do science but to be able to communicate their science broadly and think about the broader question you're asking how does my science fit into other disciplines and what are the relationships that kind of teaching is really very important and it doesn't always happen mhm how different can we teach children if we are to incorporate this Well, like like I, I you know teaching children to be able to answer questions on tests is not a good way to teach children. <laughs> um teaching children to be curious about their world and figure out ways 
to question their world and learn about their world, ultimately that's a better way to teach children. Mm -hmm. um, I have three children. None of them are scientists, but they grew up with me as their mom. And so, you know, we were always doing things to experiment with stuff like, let's bake a cake, you know, and what does mixing all these things have to do to turn out to be a cake in the end and trying to talk about it in those kinds of terms rather than follow the recipe and the cake will be made, you know, so. How, how strong, like, uh, what's your opinion about the statement? If you can't explain it to your a six year old, you don't know it enough. I think that's absolutely true. And mm. I had some significant discussions, discussions with some of my scientific colleagues about that, where they, I've had them say to me, I could never explain what I do. You need to have a graduate degree in blah, 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 to understand what I do. And I fundamentally disagree with that person. I think, mm. I, I think that you should be able to explain what you do. Maybe not all the gory details, maybe not the more sophisticated mathematics, but you should be able to explain why you're doing, what are you trying to learn? What are you trying to do? You should be able to explain that to someone. Do, do, do you see a connection between astronomy, philosophy, and spirituality? So I'm sure there, there are connections. Um, mm -hmm. Many scientists, um, astronomers, philosophers are very spiritual people. Um, it's not something that I think deeply about. Um, I, I find spirituality in, in different things that I do in music in nature. Um, I don't really find spirituality in, in the research that I do, but I understand that some of the research that I do can open windows for other people that they find deeply spiritual. And so I, I resonate with that. I can understand that. Was, was, was there a point in your career where you were like you found a discovery or you observed something and was that like a spiritual moment for you? Uh, I think that um, when I had made discoveries where I knew that I was the only person, the only human who had ever learned something or seen something or uh, found something, I, I, I didn't react spiritually to that. I reacted more with joy and excitement, which is perhaps a, a manifestation of spirituality. I've had other experiences in my life, though, that to me were more spiritual experiences that, mm -hmm. um, that my being an astronomer allowed me to have. Like One example of this was one night I was working on the top of a mountain. So I'm I'm at, you know, 14,000 feet, nobody around me, you know, people at other places on the mountaintop, but I was alone. Um, and we were so high, we're halfway to space, literally. We were so high that there were clouds below me and there were thunderstorms happening in the clouds below me and I could see them and they were shooting lightning bolts up into the sky and... I was sitting there on this top of the mountain, you know, trying to connect my mind to millions of miles away. And below me was just this whole world that was dynamic and active. And that was a really spiritual moment for me, that I was mm -hmm. in the middle of this sort of nexus from the ground to the clouds, to lightning, to the skies, to the heavens that I was reaching with my telescope. And I didn't make a discovery at that moment, but the moment was spiritual. The moment connected me beyond where me, where I was in the moment, uh, both to the earth and to the heavens. Does that? Uh, yeah, yeah. The, the reason why I ask that is because you've most of your life you have thoughts on a grander scale, right? Mm -hmm. Uh, comparing to an average person, the thoughts running in your head will be on a galactic grander scale. And that is really ego bursting. And 
and grounding and and connects you to something more than human probably i maybe uh, maybe i don't know i think there's a lot of astronomers who think on those super galactic scales so don't think about it spiritually and mm-hmm, i think mm-hmm. there are people who will walk out to the woods and they will sit in the woods and they will look at the life around them whether it is plant life animal life you know insects butterflies birds and they'll have an intensely spiritual experience and there mm-hmm. can be an astronomer who's like you know doing calculations of galaxies that are like insanely large and they're not having a spiritual experience so i'm not sure that astronomy holds any special sway that way you know <laughs> Uh, but you also mentioned you know so many astronomers who are deeply spiritual i do know many who are very spiritual yeah but that mm. doesn't necessarily mean they're spiritual because they're astronomers Int- interesting it, it it takes you to get out of that left brain that we talked about earlier yeah i mean one thing i mean i will say one thing scientists mm-hmm. can be very spiritual because they are asking questions all the time that's that's our job as scientists is to ask questions and many of us are asking questions about the physical world around us um and uh, but if you take it seriously that you're asking questions that sometimes leads you into different kinds of questions questions about what is consciousness what is intelligence what is learning um and and i think that a, that the science community um because our job is to ask questions um we are open to those broader kinds of questioning that you know leads you into the pathways of art or it leads you into music or it leads you into you know other other ways of connecting with other humans and the world around you uh i heard somewhere that science is the child of spirituality because both is inquiry basically inquiry of your real nature your uh, the the questioning part and when you start inquiry even if in, it it is on an atomic scale you reach quantum mechanics and string theory and you stop there and there is that the, the line gets blurry there right even if you look outside in the universe you you as as we started it's one universe and what's outside that it gets blurry there yeah. and if you go if you zoom in and if you zoom out it, it's a blurry boundary everywhere yeah i mean I, yeah i think there's some truth to that i mean one of the things that scientists like to do <laughs> to 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 make it science it, it is you have to be able to make predictions about the thing you're studying and make a measurement to find out if the prediction you made is correct if you don't do that you're you could be creating fiction you know mm. <laughs> um that's so when you get to the realm of you know what's inside a quark or string theory which you know doesn't really seem to have you know or predictable measurements um you know it it kind of veers out of science at that point that's what what you said becomes blurry or fuzzy because if there's no way to measure it or prove it's right or wrong then there's no way for us as scientists to be able to say it, it, it doesn't make sense is it logical does it does it hold together and mm-hmm. you know one of the things that um one of the things that i think about a lot as a scientist is how little we actually know especially those of us like me who are trained in the western tradition of science um I think that there are many other cultures who have experienced the world in different ways than we do in our sort of our western culture and who may have knowledge that um that we don't fully understand yet um but probably will someday we will and let me give you an example of that when uh there was a period in my life where I was having terrible terrible pain in my back and it was like some herniated disc in my neck and oh my gosh it hurt so much and I could barely function and you know oh you're going to have your neck fused and I'm like no I don't want to do that so I went to a, a a physician who 
who believed in trying anything. <laughs> so he had me try, you know, microwave radiation didn't help. He tried this, it didn't help. He's like, well, let's try acupuncture. I'm like, yeah, sure. So he puts little pins in my forehead and my back stops hurting. Hmm. Now I have no way in my classically Western training, you know, I'm not a biologist, but even if I were trained in a classical Western way, that putting pins, little needles in my forehead would stop my back from hurting. And yet it did. That's all I can tell you. And when you're in pain, all you care about is that it works. All right. And so, you know, as a scientist, I'm like, okay, I don't understand this, but clearly there is something to understanding how energy flows in some way in the human body that putting pins in one place can change things that are happening in other places. I don't mm -hmm. understand it. And, you know, I all I can say is that empirically there is a connection here somehow that works. And someday I think that it we will be able to figure out how it all works. So mm -hmm. what can I say? What's the most bizarre phenomenon you witnessed in the space? Is it black holes? Is it quasars? What's the most bizarre thing for you in space? Well, I would have to say it's something like black holes because I, I can understand the mathematics, but mm -hmm. I really tr have trouble understanding the t physical things about it. You know, like, how does that even work? I mean, I... I can understand all the evidence that we see. I, I can explain the evidence and I understand what the evidence tells us, that there must be a huge collection of mass in an incredibly small space. But, um, you know, my sort of prosaic mind just, just can't process that. You know, people ask me to explain it. But, you know, and also the whole concept of special relativity and how space mm -hmm. and time are the same thing, you know? And so if, if you're in a rocket ship and I'm in a rocket ship and we're going like different speeds, we're different ages because space and time are different, I can do the math and I can do the equations and I'm like, okay, I understand this. And, and yes, we do have evidence that shows this is correct, but do I understand it? It, it just, it's beyond our human realm of understanding, like, you know, like what I do on a daily basis, that even though I can do the math and understand it and believe it, I, I just don't get it. Do you know what I mean? Uh, certainly. I, th I think we are hitting our time limit, but yeah, I'll end with one question. Like at this point, oh, okay. Actually two questions. What is the future of astronomy going with? We talked a little bit about the inter interstellar contingent Earth similar looking planet telescope future, but is, is that it or is there a, more? Oh, there's so much more. <laughs> uh, What's the future? Yeah. What's the most exciting future? Well, you know, honestly, I do think the most exciting question that we can answer right now is, is there life on an Earth-like planet around a sun-like star? Is there an Earth 2.0 out there that someday humanity could go to? I mean, to me, that that's a that's a huge question because it has broad ramifications for, you know, biology and chemistry and physics and all sorts of stuff. So to me, I mean, that's one reason I'm so excited about working, you know, to help build this habitable worlds observatory. And when I say build it, I mean like, you know, 10 years, 15 years from now, you know, it's a long haul, just like for JWST, it was a 25 year timeline. Habitable worlds, I'm hoping is not going to be a 25 year timeline. I'm not sure I personally have 25 years left. So, um, but, you know, you know, working on it so that we can find an Earth-like planet around a sun-like star and see if its atmosphere is suggestive of the potential for biology there. To me, that is like the next big question. And it's totally within our grasp. So I'm very excited about that. If you ask a different astrophysicist, they may tell you, you know, figuring out, you know, really how many black holes there are and why black holes form. Or can we see the first stars that ever formed in the universe. You know, there's just uh, so much out there that we don't know. Um, but what I, my job today is to help build and, and operate the tools so that all the next generation of scientists 
who have great ideas greater than mine will have the tools to be able to answer them. So it's a bright future for astronomy. Wonderful, Haiti. Uh, I want to end on a philosophical note. I ask this to a lot of my guests. What is your meaning of life right now? The meaning of life right now. Wow, well, what is all this? I, that's a, such a great question. Um, I think that, you know, from my personal perspective, what's the meaning of, I can tell you what the meaning of my life is, right? Yeah, that's that's what I want because I ask to all my guests and I get all these interesting answers. Yeah, I would say that uh, the meaning of my life is, you know, to help ensure that the people that come after me, whether it's my own children or young colleagues or even children that hadn't been born yet, I want to make sure that they have a world to move into that is a beautiful world, that is a healthy world, um, that is a world filled with wonder and joy. That's that's what I try to do in my life, you know, both as a person and in my career. I'm trying to build a better future for those that are coming beyond us. Well... That was Professor Heidi Hamill sharing her stories about outer space, the universe, aliens, and our place in this universe. Hope you all enjoyed the show. If you did, don't forget to subscribe and share it with your friends. Do check out our other videos as well. This is your host Raj signing off from The Seekers Mind Talks.